Hello and welcome to World Connect, your weekly window to the world, a global picture of the mood of our times. Let's start the ball rolling with the focus of the show. Germany's symbolic resolution declaring the 1915 mass killings of Armenians by Ottoman Turks as genocide creates a diplomatic rift between Germany and NATO ally Turkey. 40 dead tiger cubs being found in the famous Wat Pad Luang Tha Bua temple in Thailand leads to speculation that the monks may be involved in trafficking. Tiger paths popular in Chinese medicines. Peru goes to the polls in a second round runoff vote on Sunday. Both candidates Keiko Fujimori and Pedro Pablo Kujenski have defeated leftist rivals in a crowded April 10 first round. And Olympic hosts Brazil have a unique pair of sisters, one representing the country in badminton. Brought up in violent Rio slums, the Vincete sisters, they have an inspiring story to tell. Old wounds take long to heal and tell us how important history is in shaping the way a nation thinks. Obviously, None of the Armenians living today have any direct link with the mass killings of their countrymen in 1915 and neither do any of the Turks who were responsible for it then. But Germany, which supported the Ottomans in 1915, has now accepted 100 years after the event that it was a genocide. Armenia says Germany owed it a moral debt, while Turkey feels the resolution is a historic mistake. Germany's Bundestag, or lower house of parliament, voted overwhelmingly on June 2 in favor of a symbolic resolution that declared killings of Armenians by Ottoman forces in 1915 a genocide. The vote sent shockwaves across Turkey, which rejects that any genocide took place. Turkey immediately recalled its ambassador to Germany in protest against the parliament resolution. President Erdogan, who was on a state visit to Kenya, had this to say at a press conference in Nairobi. We're going to sit down and we're going to discuss these issues which have the potential of impacting the relations between Germany and Turkey. Back home in Ankara, Turkish Prime Minister Bin Ali Yildirim called the resolution a historic mistake. The resolution on 1915 incidents that was adopted in German parliament with the pressure of the Armenian lobby is a historic mistake made by our friendly allies' parliament. The timing could not be worse for German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who has championed a deal with Turkey under which Ankara has agreed to stem the flow of refugees to Europe in return for cash, visa-free travel rights and accelerated talks on European Union membership. There's a lot that binds Germany to Turkey. And even if we have a difference of opinion on an individual matter, the breadth of our links, our friendship, our strategic ties is great starting with defense issues and many other issues. And last but not the least, the three million Turkish citizens that live in our country. Merkel was powerless to stop the symbolic resolution, which was initiated by the opposition Greens and also backed by lawmakers in her conservative bloc and the Social Democrats. Residents in Armenian capital Yerevan welcomed the resolution declaring the 1915 massacre of Armenians by Ottoman forces a genocide. They say Germany owed them a moral debt since in 1915 they could have exercised influence over the Turks to stop the killing but did not intervene. The nature and scale of killings in 1915 remain highly contentious. Turkey accepts that many Armenians died in partisan fighting beginning in 1915 but denies that up to 1.5 million were killed in an act of genocide, a term used by many Western historians and foreign parliaments. Going through a large part of the Alps in a matter of minutes that's been made possible by an engineering marvel, the Gotthard Base Tunnel, which is 57 kilometers long, joining northern and southern Europe. Trains shoot through the tunnel in 17 minutes now, but it took 17 years to build this masterpiece. At the most highest extensive range of mountains across Central Europe has been conquered. Switzerland inaugurated the world's longest and deepest railway tunnel on Wednesday, through the heart of the famed mountain range. The engineering marvel, called the Gotthard Base Tunnel, is 57.1 kilometers long and greatly reduces plying between Northern and Southern Europe. Passengers can now cross the distance in just 17 minutes in high-speed trains through the tunnel, which took 17 years to construct. The result is not just an infrastructural wonder, 
but a symbol of unity among the European countries. North and South approach each other. The Mediterranean meets Central European industrial landscapes. Felony meets strict key players. Monteverdi meets Baj. Tarantella meets Alpine dances. Montanaro meets Gloria. How better to say that diversity is what unites us in our Europe, our European awareness. The tunnel along Europe's main rail line connects the ports of Rotterdam in the north to Genoa in the south. The line reduces the distance between Zurich and Milan and Berlin and Milan. It meanders through the mountains 2.3 kilometers below daylight and through rock as hot as 46 degrees Celsius. Construction process involved breaking through 73 different types of rocks, some as hard as granite, while others were as soft as sugar. Flash floods and overflowing rivers battered the lives of thousands in parts of Germany and France. At least 10 people were killed in flooding over the past few days in Germany. Prolonged heavy rain in southern Germany's Bavaria state left thousands of households cut off from electricity and houses and roads totally damaged. Flooding has affected an area of around 160 square kilometers near the border with Austria and had caused damage worth tens of millions of euros. German authorities have started distributing aid to the affected people. In France, government rushed army personnel through the heavily flooded streets of Villeneuve saint georgia south of Paris, to help evacuate residents stranded in the floods. Days of torrential rains have wreaked havoc in central France, causing French President Francois Hollande on Thursday to declare a state of emergency in the worst affected areas. Hollande promised funding to help local authorities deal with flood damage. Thousands of people have been forced from their homes and dozens of schools have been closed south of Paris while the River Seine surged to its highest levels for over 30 years in the French capital. Rising water levels forced closure of the Louvre Museum. In some shocking news, police in Thailand recovered bodies of 40 tiger cubs from a freezer in Wat Pa Luang Thabua Temple. The temple has been on the tourist map for decades, where tourists would interact with tame tigers and take photographs with them. But was the temple a place where trafficking of tiger parts was taking place? Investigators will be looking into that question. The 130 living tigers are now being moved by the Thai Wildlife Authorities and Thai authorities have charged more than 20 people for alleged trafficking crimes. Once popular among tourists as a tiger sanctuary, the Buddhist temple in Kanchanaburi province, west of Bangkok, has many questions to answer now. The temple is in controversy following recovery of dozens of dead tiger cubs in a kitchen freezer on Wednesday. The Buddhist temple had become a tourist destination where visitors clicked selfies with bottle-fed cubs. But the temple has been investigated for suspected links to wildlife trafficking and abuse. The mounting allegations against the temple forced the authorities to swing into action. Armed with a court order, wildlife officials began raids on the temple early this week. The recovery of 40 carcasses in a freezer left everyone shocked and authorities started investigating the matter. More than 130 tigers from the temple have been moved and relocated. In the past, temple operators had resisted the attempts to move tigers. The discovery on Thursday of the tiger skins and charms or amulets made from skins and jars containing the bodies of tiger cubs in the temple pointed to an even more lucrative business than thought. Authorities found 20 glass jars containing baby tigers and tiger organs in a laboratory in the temple. Wildlife officials suspect the cubs were being preserved for use in potions. Tiger parts are used in traditional Chinese medicine, a multi-million dollar business that has driven tigers in the wild to the brink of extinction and fueled the rearing of tigers in parts of Asia, especially in China. The tiger temple has long been hit by controversies. From receiving its first tiger cub in 1999, the temple was recorded to have at least 137 tigers in 2016. The visitors are charged 600 Thai baht, that is nearly 16 US dollars, for entry into the temple. There are additional costs to pet or feed the tigers. Every year, thousands of people flock to the temple to have pictures with the animals. The temple reportedly has an annual income of 100 million Thai baht, with monks admitting to have generated some part of it from tiger activities. Be it missing of three tigers in 2014 or removal of microchips from the animals, 
reports of tiger breeding for profit-making purposes or allegations by former workers, back-to-back -back controversies and endless accusations made the authorities take swift action. 72,000 families have been displaced in South Waziristan in the Pakistan military's fight against the Taliban. Rooftops of houses were removed as part of a strategy to flush out militants. Now that the battle has largely been won, another one begins that of putting roofs back on people's heads. Once a Taliban stronghold, South Waziristan in Pakistan's mountainous northwest region is now welcoming thousands of displaced families returning to their homes, their own homes which no longer offer shelter. Yes, roofs of thousands of homes in South Waziristan were removed by the Pak military to have a better aerial view to spot militants and their activities. The unique way to zero in militants has now left residents clueless about where to live. They say the compensation offered by the government is not sufficient enough to rebuild houses. Our houses has been completely damaged. There is not a single room we can live in. The people of our tribe have rendered their sacrifices and in such circumstances, their families then injured should be given compensation. The government is only providing 400,000 rupees to rebuild our houses. The cost of our house is 10 million rupees and we cannot rebuild our houses with such a small amount. Army claims that all the militants have been flushed out of the region. A campaign named Rahe Nijat was launched in 2009 against the tehreek e taliban Pakistan, displacing more than 72,000 families. Pakistani authorities claim to have rebuilt roads, constructed health facilities and schools and reinforced the water supply in villages in the area. But the roofless residents are still awaiting for a shelter. The remains of 33 Australian soldiers killed during the Vietnam War and buried in Malaysia and Singapore returned to rest in Australia on Thursday. The soldiers, who were buried overseas under an internment policy, that was scrapped in 1966, were flown into the military airfield around 40 kilometers west of Sydney on board two enormous military transport jets. The Australian government last year announced it would fund a repatriation program for the fallen soldiers following pressure from families and public petitions. For family members and veterans in attendance, it was a bittersweet moment more than 50 years in the making. A Japanese boy abandoned in a dense forest by his parents for being naughty was found alive and unharmed on Friday. Nearly a week after his disappearance set off a massive search that kept the nation riveted. Seven-year-old Yamato Tanuka was discovered in a building on a Japanese military base around four kilometers from where he disappeared last Saturday after his parents left him by the side of a road. Yamato Tanuka was found and rescued by two JSDF personnel who entered the bunker on Friday morning seeking shelter from the rain. Yamato's father made a tearful apology for what he described as his excessive behavior. Democratic presidential hopefuls Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton are battling it out for the June 7 California primaries. California, which has been a stronghold of Clinton, is keeping hopes high for Bernie Sanders, with huge crowds thronging his rallies. A recent poll claimed that Sanders has a narrow lead over Hillary Clinton, contrary to earlier polls that showed the former first lady ahead of the Vermont senator. Now, Clinton has been spending a lot of time in California, which offers nearly 550 delegates. Clinton needs just 70 delegates to reach the benchmark 2,383 to secure the nomination, while Sanders wants more than 830 delegates. For Sanders, a mere narrow win is not going to change anything, while even if Clinton loses and in a worst-case scenario gets only 10 to 15 percent of the delegates, she'll make it. Many see this Tuesday as the final step for Clinton to reach the mark. At a rally in California aimed at urging women to vote in large numbers, Clinton lambasted Donald Trump, saying he's unfit to be president. I believe absolutely that he's not only unprepared to be president, he is temperamentally unfit to be president. He doesn't. 
He doesn't really have ideas. He just engages in rants and personal feuds and outright lies, something that our country cannot afford in a commander in chief. Also campaigning in California, Senator Bernie Sanders urged his supporters to show up at the polls in large numbers. Peru goes to the polls in a second round runoff vote on Sunday. Frontrunner Kieko Fujimori is the daughter of the former president Alberto Fujimori of Japanese origin, who's in jail, in fact, for alleged human rights violations. She's up against the former prime minister, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, and both candidates have an anti-left stance. Peruvian voters will seal on Sunday the fates of presidential candidates Kiki Fujimori and Pedro Pablo Kuczynski in the runoff vote. With poll surveys showing Fujimori enjoying a slight lead, her rival Kuczynski is also hoping to make it, banking on the voters that remain undecided until the voting day. It is Fujimori's second bid to become Peru's first female president. A tough stance on crime and years of campaigning in poor villages in the populist style of a right-wing father helped her surge ahead of her rivals. 40 years old, Kieko is the daughter of imprisoned ex-president Alberto Fujimori. In his third term, Fujimori was forced out of office in a cloud of accusations of corruption and abuses. He was later sentenced to 25 years in prison for human rights crimes, stemming from his crackdown on leftist rebels of the Shining Path Party. Kieko's critics fear a return to the days when her father ruled the Andean nation by decree despite her repeated promises to respect the democratic institutions he trampled before his government collapsed in a vast corruption scandal in 2000. A supportive stance of the social safety network that millions of poor Peruvians rely on despite nearly two decades of robust economic growth helped her consolidate lead. Because they have promised us so much, they made so many promises that will never come true. But during these tour stops, what I most admire are those people who will never lose faith in the search for change in our country. The change that we in our party and those we speak with are going to achieve for Peru. Pedro Pablo Kuczynski is widely viewed as honest and experienced, but is seen as less supportive of the social welfare plans. He has vowed to ease taxes and draw on private investments for new infrastructure projects to fuel growth. Kuczynski wrapped up his campaign saying he would take voters to the future, while a vote for Fujimori would take the country back to dark days of corruption. We have to speak clearly. On Sunday, Peru will decide which path it will take. Are we going to go backwards towards darkness, corruption, bribes, or are we going to go forward, going up and up, every day up? Both candidates are free market champions who defeated leftist rivals in a crowded April 10 first round vote. Africa is looking at the renewable energy landscape. Many landlocked countries are finding Solar power is the solution to their energy needs. Electricity is of vital importance as it is necessary to power irrigation systems and help countries like Chad, for instance, with food security. Africa is turning green. Morocco, Chad, Malawi, Tunisia, Senegal, Kenya are all looking to tap on renewable sources of energy. In landlocked Central African country Chad, only 5% of the population receives electricity from public utilities. Power is reserved for the wealthy who can afford a generator and diesel for it outside urban areas. To meet essential electricity needs, the country has now learned to look at the sun as a very important source of energy. It's important that this new way of thinking of microgrids uh, and solar energy it's debated and we prepare the path for the future where if there is going to be large-scale implementation there has to be local uh, capacity to design them and to, and to plan those uh, infrastructures. For farmers, irrigation is a very important process in this desert region. The power from the sun equips farmers with an efficient irrigation system which is even better than the diesel-powered motors. The result? Better crops. We have increased the quantity and quality of the vegetables. The water is at a depth of 20 meters, so it's better that we use electricity to get it. The three initial solar power stations set up for this purpose are proving successful. Demand for electricity is on the rise in all the sites. The projects have also increased job opportunities for the locals. Lessons learned in these innovative projects will hopefully inspire new ones, not just in Chad, but with other nations too. 
power to the powerless that costs less too. Here are some more stories catching attention elsewhere. A traditional 8th century variant of chess played in Myanmar is gaining popularity once again in the age of apps. The game is one of strategy and the pieces are placed in a formation that uses most of the 64 squares board in rank and file right from the first move onwards. King, General, Elephant, Horse, Chariot and Feudal Lords. Welcome to the world of Situin. Myanmar's traditional chess game. The word is derived from Sit which means army in Burmese. The red and black pieces made of ivory or wood rampage the 64 squares of the chessboard. The way you play Situyin reflects the way war was fought in Myanmar history. Situyin is believed to be over 1000 years old and experts look at it as an important variant in the diverse game of chess across the world. In Myanmar, enthusiasts try to bring back the game from the sporting wilderness. Lack of words that were sold off to tourists for their antique value and lack of knowledge about the rules of the game pushed Situin off mainstream use. In a move to popularize the game, sets made of plastic and for the tech-loving generation applications have been launched to make it more interesting. Players can change the characters and it makes it more fun. It's not a waste of time to play this game. We believe it helps you to develop strategic ways of thinking. Players in this game initially deploy troops. They arrange armies on their side of the board. The goal of the game is to checkmate the king of the opponent. In the place of the queen in western chess is the general or sitke. Elephants take on the role of bishops, while the horse takes on that of the knight. The rook is played by the chariot and pawns by feudal lords. Defend the king. Think strategy. Traditional Burmese chess on the revival. Coming up the hard way often describes people who have defied the odds to achieve success. In Brazil's Rio de Janeiro, ready to host the Olympics in August this year, there is a pair of sisters one of whom will be representing her country in badminton. Fondly called the Williams Sisters of Rio, they have overcome a childhood marred by fear and violence. Rio de Janeiro, the city of carnivals, the city of beaches, the city of fun, the city which hosts the Olympics. The other side of the famed Brazilian city is notoriety. The slums are den of violent activities, drug cartels and so. Here is one such story of two sisters who grew up in the dark side of the city and made their way to the top. Loheni and Luana Vicente now belong to an elite group of Brazil's badminton players. 20-year-old Loheni represents her country in the first Olympic tournament to be held in South America. It is the first time that Brazil is going to take part in badminton in the Olympics and I'm the first woman so I think it is significant for badminton. Violence was a close part of the sisters' past. As little kids, the girls had to move around a lot as their father, a drug dealer, 
hid from the police and rival gangs. He was killed in a shootout with the police when Loheni was six years and Loana was just four years old. The girls then moved with their mother to the northern part of the city where their skills with the racket were soon up front. We started when we were living in the Shakrina community where there was a social project teaching only badminton. In Shakrina, they also had soccer, but as we did not like soccer, we started out with badminton and really liked it. Then we started to play tournaments and travel the world. The girls have now a house paid for by the Brazilian Badminton Federation near Sao Paulo. They also earn a salary and have sponsorship deals. Work and play is part of their daily lives. Everyone can make it to where they want to be. All you have to do is want it. I wanted to be here, I wanted to be an example and I worked hard for it. When I stepped up on that podium, I saw my whole history, everything I had done to get to that point. Loheni and Luana, fondly called the Brazilian William sisters, took the tough ride to the top. They didn't let their environment, family, society around deter them. While they had a clear-cut goal throughout, persistence and hard work took them there. This brings us to the end of this edition of World Connect. Do send us your feedback. You can write to us at our email ID, which is worldconnectwithak.ddnews@gmail.com. And you can also send us feedback on Facebook. But as we wrap up, here are some images of the International Children's Day celebrations in North Korea. Thanks very much for watching. Namaskar. Thank you, thank you.